Hi, I'm Gabby. And I'm Sid. And this is Musician's Tea Time. Today, we have a special guest that we were really looking forward to. Uh, he was uh, one of the founding members of one of our favorite bands. Do you want to talk a little more about our guest today? Yep, this is Richard Gibbs, and he is a music industry veteran, the real salty sea dog. Over the course of this interview, we follow his career from Berkeley to Woodshed Recording, passing through Rockstar Life in the Ongo Bongo, session work for the likes of Robert Palmer, Aretha Franklin, or Tom Waits, film scoring, and more. Very interestingly, we'll go over the history of unionizing in the music industry, but most importantly, something Rich has been hosting for the better part of the last decade, the Composer's Breakfast Club. Um, it's a weekly Monday morning hang for artists and non-artists alike, and as you'll find out, it's an interesting place full of interesting people to stimulate critical thinking. I love critical thinking. Uh, I think there's a lack of it recently, but that's another story. Richard also has a podcast of his own, counting heaps of his stories and anecdotes for working in 40 years in the music industry. It's wholesome, surreal, heartwarming at times, and thought-provoking and carefully crafted in both substance and form. So without further ado, let's get straight to this kindly granted chat then. Relax and enjoy. Uh, welcome, Richard, our second guest for uh, the Musicians Tea Time podcast by Acid Airplane Records. Um, we're based in France, and I don't know if many people do know you in France. So, do you think you could in- introduce yourself and your career to us? Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> oh, Google me. I mean, just go to richardgibbs.com, <laughs> I guess, and that's the easiest way to find out. I, I always feel uncomfortable talking to somebody and telling them what I do and what I've done. But in a nutshell, I am a, um, a reformed rock star, I guess, and session player and turned film and television composer and record producer and studio owner and general entrepreneur in the entertainment industry. Right. So you do, you own um, the Woodshed studio, right? It's called Woodshed Recording. Yeah. Woodshed I own recording. Woodshed recording. Right. You can, it's uh, online. It's woodshedrecording.com. Right. Yeah. I did say there are some, there's some really nice fancy gear out there, um, which we'll probably get back to later because there's a, there's quite a bunch of things we can go over. But um, you are also, you have a podcast yourself. You're, uh, you're a great storyteller. Many people do tell you that. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, invisiblearts.com, arts being plural, invisiblearts.com. And it's called that because music is the only invisible art. Ah, true. <laughs> I didn't thought of it like that. But, um, right. So um, myself, I am, I'm 21 and I've just graduated with a music industry degree. And um, I've had that feeling getting into the industry that there might be a bit of feeling of hopelessness and disillusion did it feel the same back then when you graduated from um what do you do berkeley right i uh, yes i uh my degree is classical composition from berkeley college of music right how did it feel back then um just you graduate and you get into the industry was it different well i was different everything was different yeah i mean it was uh i, I didn't I didn't go to Berkeley with the idea of becoming a film composer at all. I mean, I studied composition, my degree is classical composition, but my goal, I wanted to be Joe Zawinul. And you, you probably don't know who that is, but um, he was my hero, keyboard player in the band and, and founder of the band or co-founder of the band Weather Report. And all right. He used to play with Miles Davis and everybody else. That was Really, what I wanted to do was be be like Joe Zawinul. I wanted to be a performer, a player, and a and a composer in that realm. Uh, but uh, fate had other ideas in mind for me. As far as I know, you did that for a while, and then uh... not really. I didn't do what I really wanted to do, which was um, Weather Report and Mahavishnu Orchestra. And other bands and other artists like that are very much, uh, you know, jazz fusion. It's all about mm-hmm. the the playing ability and the chops and and the composition in that style. And I tried. I did some stuff like that very, very early on, but relatively quickly started making all sorts of left turns. 
Actually, I have a podcast about that. One of my uh, one of my episodes is uh, about Miles Davis and how how I was drawn to the music of Miles Davis and how I started down that road and then didn't go there. End up going somewhere else. Mm, right. I think I did listen to that one because I do tune in every couple of weeks. They come out. And uh, what is great about them, I find, is they're very bite-sized and they feel very comfortable. They really do feel like you're telling, um, well, as you said, um, you're telling your grandkids a story. Yeah, it's, um, you know, they're, I, I script them. You know, I, I use that term loosely, but I write it out first. Most of these stories are stories I've told a million times, but I write it out anyway. And then the, I create these like little radio shows. This is not a typical podcast where, you know, typically podcasts are interviews or a couple of guys talking around a microphone and they tend to be, you know, most podcasts are like 45 minutes to two hours long. And I find myself, I don't have the patience for it. So as a listener, right, I, I like them short and sweet. I like, I like a story. And, you know, a beginning, a middle and an end and wrap it up and be done with it. And so that's the goal that I started with. I didn't start the podcast. I didn't, I never started a podcast. That's the funny thing. I, I was, I had a story that I'd been telling a true story about how I ended up working with Robert Palmer. Again, you're, you know, you may not know who Robert was, but he had I several didn't. big hits. Oh, okay. Well, um, <laughs> I ended up recording, playing, you know, being a session player on some of Robert Palmer's work. And that all started with me writing a letter of complaint to Robert Palmer because I was staying in a condo right next door to him and, and his music was keeping me up at night. So <laughs> it was uh, uh, it was kind of a tongue in cheek letter of complaint because he was a hero of mine and ended up you know, meeting him and then playing on some demos, which led to me uh, recording with him uh, in earnest in both Com at Compass Point in the Bahamas. And then a few months later at um, in Milan, Italy, and I played on the song uh, Simply Irresistible. And that whole album was called Heavy Nova. So I was playing keyboards yeah. on that. So that's that first podcast. That's a story I had told many times and I kind of had it down. I, I knew, you know, I just told the story so many times it was all memorized. And I recorded it just for grins because I got tired of telling the story. And I wanted, I just wanted to, to record it. So if somebody were asking me about it, I'd say, yeah, I'll send it to you later. And, <laughs> and, then, um, and then while I was at it with my engineer, we started having fun with it and putting in sound effects and dropping in songs that were appropriate to the story, including Simply Irresistible, you know, little snippets of stuff to kind of illustrate the story and packaged it all up and sent it off to my manager, just said, hey, maybe you'll get a kick out of this. I don't want to tell the story anymore. And he flipped out over, he thought it was great and sent it off to this company, Pantheon Podcasts, who immediately offered me a contract to do a podcast series. I said, do you have more stories like this? And I said, yeah, I, you know, yeah, I got stories for days, but. Um, pretty crazy said, that they offered your contract. Well, the contract is, you know, it's pretty loose. As you may know, there's not money in podcasts, you know, typically, I mean, unless you're Joe Rogan, most yeah. people aren't making money doing podcasts. It's a it's a kind of a labor of love, or the purpose of doing it is as a branding exercise to promote something else, whether it's your own career, um, or in my case, I'm promoting a, a nonprofit that I founded called Armory of Harmony, and I wanted to use it to promote that and to promote my recording studio. So. That's the reason behind doing it, but then it became more fun for me to think about it in terms of I'm doing it for my grandkids and great grandkids, you know, whenever they show up. So um, that 
people can hear these stories in my words instead of them being, um, you know, changed over the years or just forgotten. So that's it. Right. Well, yeah, well, that's a great endeavor. And it always feels very, um, you know, the, the way that you put sounds in there, uh, songs as well, really makes it all feel like it's got a whole ambience to it. And it just feels very, um, maybe it comes from your background in film, but it feels very cinematographic, cinematic. Oh. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I'm a, I'm a film composer, so I'm I'm used to telling a story with music and with sound. So it's uh, that's fun for me. It comes naturally. I don't have to think about it. But it is time consuming. Most people that are doing a podcast, maybe they'll interview somebody like you're interviewing me right now, and you'll take whatever amount of time it is to do that interview, whether it's ten minutes or an hour, and then you know, edit it down uh, and kind of wrap a bow on it and put it out. And that's pretty much it for a typical podcast. But I create these like radio shows. So a typical podcast, somebody will spend an hour or two on it, making it um, once, you know, once they've got it down to a, a system. But my podcasts, even though they're only 20 minutes long, typically take about three relatively solid days to do it wow. just because mm -hmm. you know we, we take our time about making sure you got the right song in there we got the right edit of the song making sure everything times out and then uh you know laying in the sound effects and then going back and editing the story a little bit and vetting the making sure the quotes are correct and things i'm saying are right so it it just takes time to do it right in at least to my standard so they're, they're a little different than most podcasts. I mean, there are plenty of podcasts that are very well done, I think, but most most are pretty slapdash, and this is not. Oh, of course. Well, it sounds like it's, well, because it's short, you could assume that it's made very quickly, but I would have never yeah, expected that it took days. Yeah, no, it's not. It's it's. I think the shortest I've done one is two days. Most of them are three. Sometimes, you know, it might be three hours one day, four hours another and sometimes sometimes it's like mm -hmm. a two or three eight hour days it just depends on the on the subject and all the research and all the sound effects the last one i did that we just dropped on monday uh, i did something completely different just for fun as an experiment i recorded a rhythm track uh, a buddy of mine is a guitarist and he just played like a, a rhythm guitar, kind of like a, a Bo Diddley kind of guitar part, a shuffle. And mm -hmm. it was, a, yeah, it's a shuffle guitar part. And I played percussion and just played a, um, a very simple percussion part and just made a loop of it just so I had something. And then I told the story to that so that I had, I was now the kind of in essence, the lead singer over a rhythm track, even though I'm just telling a story. And I found that it gave me a different rhythm in how I told the story. I didn't end up, I didn't use that track that we put down. It, 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 no part of that is actually in the podcast, but it completely affected how I told the story and gave it a, a certain urgency and rhythm that we then went back and laid in music and sound effects after the fact it was kind of fun with little kind of flip the script for a minute i may, I may do that more i don't know it's, it was a fun experiment it slowed down the process but it was fun of course well there is rhythm to storytelling and that's a very big part of it that takes takes a while to get down yeah yeah i'm pretty new to podcasting well you know big big old quotes around that because i um that's just because of covid because i used to do interviews at shows and festivals and such in the past and so you know you're given a very very short uh, the manager gives you a very short time period to do that and you have to squeeze in 15 minutes and then the person talks for uh, 30 and you get yelled at so just a bit more chill to do that online although it would be much better to do a radio show format right personally i'm young i don't have stories to tell and you're more of a um, a mentor type figure for some people, I think. Well, it comes with old age, I guess. You know, like you say, I, <laughs> it's you know, an old I, age, but 
Well, I've got rather. experience. Okay, it's seasoning. Let's use that word. <laughs> it, I've been uh, I've been around. You know, I got. Uh, I always like saying that line. It's what's that from? I've been around. You know, it's it's Al Pacino, and I, uh, I think it's from. Uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the movie. The one um, where he plays the blind guy. Oh, the movie. The movie is called Scent of a Woman. It's at one point somebody he's Al Pacino's talking to somebody, and he goes. I've been around, you know, meaning like I've, I've seen it all. You know, don't, you're not going to pull one over on me. And that's kind of, that's kind of me in a way in the, in the music industry. I've been around, I've played a lot of roles. I've done a lot of different things. I've seen a lot of stuff. I've done a lot of stuff. So somewhere along the line, I've uh, developed, you know, some stories and I know how sometimes I can, guide people that that are new relative newbies and they want to know how to go about doing any number of things in the industry well i can speak with uh a certain degree of expertise about many topics about what it's like to be a session player i can talk about what it's like to you know have record contracts and be be an artist i've done that i can talk about record production i can talk about owning a studio in the the ins and outs of that, what, you know, whether, by the way, it's not worth it. Um, and then, um, and then of course, film scoring and film production. Um, these are all areas that I have more than the average amount of experience in. So if somebody comes to, I have a standing rule with um, people I, every once in a while, I'm a, I'm, and get an email or a text message from somebody who graduated from my alma mater from Berkeley. And somebody said, Oh, you should call up Richard and you know, he, maybe he can help you give you some ideas how to get started. And I'll, my standing rule is I will, t- you come out to Malibu um, and we'll go out to lunch. You buy me a sandwich and I'll talk as long as that sandwich lasts. That's my standing rule. See, I feel like that's something um, very particular with you compared to many other, um, well, seasoned industry professionals I've been able to meet or just, you know, see and uh, share a room with. Uh, is that you have uh, that very down-to-earth feeling and you're, you know, you don't look down on people who are just, you know, getting into the industry such as me. I've had my... I've had my little nonprofit art structure for about two years now. And, um, you know, I, I've never felt unwelcome at the Composer's Breakfast Club. It's, it doesn't feel like anything um, elite or uh, VIP. It's just very, very welcoming. And I feel like that's something you Well, that's, value. that's the whole point um, of the Breakfast Club. I mean, the whole point of it is to welcome people in. And to uh, and help each other out. The I've been to too many networking events over the years, um, where you know everybody has to wear a name tag, and everybody's kind of looking over everybody's shoulder, like, is there somebody better I should be talking to? And everybody is there, or so many, at least a majority of the people are there to find out what they can get you know, what they can get from other people. They're trying to take, right, one way or the mm-hmm. other, whether it's a phone number or a contact or uh, whatever it is, they're looking for something. They come to these networking events trying to further themselves and their career. And uh, this started with the Composers Breakfast Club, started with a couple of other seasoned vets like myself, and I getting together for breakfast and just just having breakfast together and sharing stories, just the three of us. And then we started inviting other friends and we've kept that ethos all along. It's all about how can we help each other? What, what, what do we have to say to each other? What's, what's going on? What's new in your world? And it's so much more, you you, it, ironically, you get so much more as a result of that. Since that's the ethos, I get more out of it than I would if I was saying, okay, what, what can you do for me? Instead, it's what can I do for you? Mm. And 
you you learn so much more that way. You get so much more. It's like, you know, it's the old line about teachers. Teachers learn more than the students. Um, you know, in teaching, you learn because in order to teach somebody, you better learn. You better know your topic and you better study up on it constantly. And then the students bring something fresh you never would have thought of. And that's what this is like for me. The Breakfast Club is a, uh, I meet people I wouldn't have met any other way. And if I can help them, great. If there's anything I can offer, great. If not, that's fine too. We just, um, and then now we started, you know, well, for several years now, it started just people having breakfast, but then little by little, like one of the other guys would say, Hey, I've got this, uh, you know, this publisher who's got a, a new way to publish music. Could he come speak to the group, you know, for over breakfast? And yeah, sure. And then we would always buy them breakfast for coming and sharing their story with us. And then one time we had a guy come who's the manager of a large studio in Nashville. And he heard about the group and he wanted to come to our breakfast and talk to us about what he was doing about the studio. And, and he was going to buy, and he did buy all of us breakfast, which was kind of a unique spin on it. He was basically paying to speak. And, uh, and it was really fun. And it kind of little light bulb went off of my head. It's like, Oh, this is a, this is a quid pro quo that goes on here. The speakers get something out of it too. They're getting access to a very focused uh, group of individuals who by and large are pretty intelligent and certainly creative and have a different spin on things than just going and speaking to, you know, a convention of accountants or something, not, not to disparage accountants, but it's a, um, you know, it's a unique group. And now we've kind of built up this snowball effect, this head of steam where the, the speakers that we've had have been so great that other people want to come in and speak. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm flattered by the people that come and, and speak with us. And, and by the way, I'm, the role that I take is the curator of that. Um, that's the one thing I enjoy is helping to find is finding people to speak that would be, that'll challenge the group. Um, there are plenty of organizations already as uh, ASMAC and others where uh, you can go in and listen to composers speak. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but I don't have composers speak by and large. Is very, very few exceptions to that rule, and only because they had something else to talk about. I'm not really terribly interested in hearing how a composer creates music. That's what I do. I don't need them to tell me how to do what yeah, I do. You know already. Right. I, well, at least I know how I like to do it. And I, I'm more interested in the guy, like the guy we had last week that um, – you know, broke the speed record for a glider plane. Oh, absolutely. That was crazy. You know, got it. What was it? 543 miles an hour or something with a, with a plane with no, remote control plane with no engine on it and got it to go that fast by playing with wind patterns. That's fascinating to me. And to me, that's more nurturing to creativity to be challenged to think about things outside of your normal experience. So I try to find those people. And even if they are musicians and composers or whatever, what I'm interested in is what they do that's outside of what they do as composers, other aspects of their backstory and what they, and what they do. So, you know, Stuart Copeland is a film composer, but I didn't really want Stuart to talk about that. And he didn't, I was more interested in, He's also quite a musicologist and music historian in a way and a fantastic storyteller. And he was the drummer in the police. There were a bunch of fun things to talk about with him. I, I wanted to hear that from him. So uh, we've got, uh, you know, my, my buddy Riza is going to be speaking on Monday and boy, does he have stories, oh, yeah. you know, 
Oh, I'm not yeah, listening. That's, that's <laughs> going to be a good one. I mean, he's he's an interesting human being. So that's what I'm interested in. It's interesting, interesting human beings with interesting stories that will inspire us all. Um, I don't care even what they do necessarily. It's how they do it. It's always, yeah, it's always very interesting no matter the topic and it can get people out of their comfort zone um, when it comes to interests as well. So plus the people are just generally so down to earth and kind that it just makes you feel very relaxed about the industry as a whole when it feels like a gigantic monster when you're young and little and getting started, you know, seeing nice people for a change. Is yeah, I mean, nice. I had people help me out um, when I first got going. Um, well, for example, um, I don't know if you know the name Michael Boddicker. Sure. But Michael's, well, Michael's a regular on the breakfast club. He's a few years older than me. When I first moved to town and was just getting started, one of the, um, you know, angles that I was working on was being a session player. And Michael kind of took me under his wing and started, um, you know, throwing work my way as a session player, work that he didn't want to do, or might've been a, sometimes there were back then they used to do sessions on TV and film where they would hire three, four, even five keyboardists at the same time to all play at once um, because composers didn't typically know how to program and do that stuff. Now that doesn't happen anymore. But back then, if you wanted that sound, you've got a whole bunch of keyboard players in one room and we all worked on it together. And Michael used to bring me in on those dates a lot because I brought something different to the table than he did. And so did the other guys. And I learned a lot from that. So, you know, I'm repaying that, you know, however I can, you know, paying it forward, as they say. Right. Well, it does feel like you're paying it forward with um, just, you know, the, the fact that you're not being condescending or, or looking down upon anybody is just, you know, something that I'm very, very Well, let me for. let me correct myself just for a second. I, I, it makes it sound like I've got this altruistic streak a mile wide and I just want to help other people. That's, that's actually a lie. The truth is, I like doing this because I get these speakers that come in that challenge me. And I want, I want to have those conversations. Mm. I want to hear what they have to say. And if it wasn't for having this group of people, I probably wouldn't, I probably wouldn't get Robert F. Kennedy Jr. to come in and talk about vaccines in my living room. But with a group of people, we can talk to RFK Jr. and have a fascinating conversation. True, but you could be an asshole about it, and you're not. Well, what's the point of that? You know, I just, you know, I want to have, uh, I want to learn. So that's the, that's the biggest part of this. That's the fun of it for me. Um, I'm, you know, if if I was bored with the speakers that we had, and I already knew what they were going to say and all that, I wouldn't do this flat out. I just would, I would let somebody else do it. I'm not going to do it. I, mm. I'm, so that's what I get out of it. That's what's cool to me. That guy that spoke, the glider guy, right? Um, I didn't know him from Adam. I just happened to see a uh, something popped up in my Facebook feed or somewhere or in a news feed that this guy had just broken the speed record for a remote controlled plane. And I, you know, and I looked at the video and thought, well, that's just cool as hell. And put his name in to Facebook. And sure enough, there he was on Facebook. I friended him. He friended me right back. I sent him a message. I said, hey, I'd love to talk to you about this group. And within an hour, I had him booked to speak to the breakfast club. That's pretty much how it kind of works, you know, being gutsy and like, you know, the worst thing somebody can say is no. So well, I don't consider that gutsy. I mean, who cares? If he said no, he said no. You know, it's not, it doesn't hurt me. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Exactly. That's that's what they told me. So, you know, that's just why I, that is how I, you know, I added you. You didn't know me. I just, <laughs> that's just how it happens. And um, I'm grateful that you, that, you know, you're, you're fine with talking with the, the little guys well, as well. You know, it's also part of, uh, there's another, sit here, I told you I was going to want to plug my podcast. One of the, uh, one of the episodes <laughs> is called Never Be Home. And the concept of that was that I realized in retrospect how much of my career was based on 
just being outgoing, being out in the world, literally never being home, going out and going to, whether it's, mm. I mean, one of the stories in there is about how I got a job scoring a movie because I happened to meet the director at Chuck E. Cheese of all places. So you never know. One of my favorite stories. <laughs> you never know where you're going to meet somebody. And now these days, we, you know, right now, at least we, we don't have that. So we have to do that digitally, uh, you know, and virtually. Um, it's not as good, but, but it does have its advantages. We can reach out to people all over the world much easier now. Everybody's used to this format and um, meet a lot of people. We got a lot of people that speak at the breakfast club now that are, you know, all over the world. We had, we've had people speak from London and Melbourne and certainly New York, plenty of people and uh, geez, I don't know, Vienna uh, all over. Right. So uh, Tokyo. So that, you know, in person that wouldn't be happening, but it's fun. You know, it's fun, but, but the point is never be home, get out, get out, get out, get out and meet people and, and, and learn. And that's where, that's where things happen. They aren't going to happen sitting at home. They just won't. Yeah, absolutely. I guess that you're really corny saying that, uh, you miss hundred percent of the shots you don't take and so on. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, when it comes to, you know, film gigs and you know scoring gigs or even regular gigs um was it as precarious back then as it is well now? i don't know i don't know how to answer that precarious um again I, this sounds a little weird but i didn't come I, as i already said i didn't come to town to be a film composer i came in town to be a player to be a keyboardist And um, and the film scoring work, the very first job that I got as a film composer came to me. Uh, somebody, uh, an engineer buddy of mine, knew about this movie where the director wanted somebody to do arrangements of Elvis Presley songs and just do something, to do a different approach to the film score. And he, he needed somebody that was as much a record producer as they were a composer, actually probably more record producer than a composer. And, but I had training as a composer. I understood how film scoring worked and I had already had a fair amount of seasoning as a session player and a little bit as a producer. So I went and met with the director. And one of the first things he said to me was, um, I'm not looking to hire a film composer And I looked right at him and said, that's great, because I'm not a film composer. I haven't <laughs> scored anything. <laughs> and we hit it off. And sure enough, as we, you know, he hired me pretty much on the spot after I pitched how I would go about adapting songs into score for him. And I was just winging it on the spot and just coming up with ideas how to do it. And he liked the way I thought. And we're friends to this day still. And he... um Once I got into the movie, it became clear that he actually did need some music composed, not just arranged. And, you know, and I said, well, I, you know, I know how to do that. I'm trained to do that. Why don't you let me write some, he goes, yeah, do it. And so that ended up being my first film scoring credit. And uh, that led to the music supervisor on that movie knew about this um, job uh, being the musical director for the Tracy Ullman show. And the Tracy Ullman show was on Fox at the time. And she had gone through a couple of different musical directors in the time period that she had started the show for one reason or another, they hadn't worked out or left, moved on. And, Uh, so I said, sure. They said, you want to go meet with Tracy? And I met with Tracy and the producers on the show. And I'm, and I didn't know any better, right? I just walked in and they said, well, this is how we do it. You know, Tracy sings to a pre-record and that's how we're doing it. And I said, I don't want to do it that way. And they're looking at me, what? You just walked in. We don't know you from Adam. 
and you're telling us how you're going to do it, not not listening to how we want to do it. And I said, well, I, I think it's much more fun if the band is live on set and we'll play live while Tracy sings instead of having pre-recorded tracks that she sings to. And I watched Tracy's eyes light up. She thought, well, that sounds like fun. And I also watched the producers like kind of shivering in their seats, like, oh God, what a nightmare. This is going to cost a fortune and so on. But because Tracy liked the idea, they signed me to the world's shortest contract of two weeks. I said, okay, let's see how this works. Wow. And um, and I figured it out. It worked perfectly. I brought in the record plant remote truck, brought in my own band, my own rock band at that time, who were all really good session players. And did exactly what I said we're going to do. We we would be off camera playing while Tracy is singing. And uh, and I'm learning how to be a musical director on the spot. I had a lot of fun with it. Tracy loved it. And next thing you know, I, you know, I did that for a couple of years. And that show, the Tracy Ullman show, was the um, the birthplace of The Simpsons. The Simpsons was a one-minute short on the Tracy Allman show, which is a whole other fun story, how that came to be. But it was just these bizarre little one-minute shorts, all different. The animation style was quite different. It was all hand-done. And um, I met Matt Groening. The, show, the shorts didn't have music typically, but every once in a while he'd need a little piece of source music or something and he'd come to me and say yeah I'll, I'll knock that out for you and it would just take me a few minutes and we kind of became friends and they took a shot fox that is decided let's let's um let's put this out as a a series let's do a prime time animated show which was pretty unheard of really and it was it was a hail mary pass fox was going under Fox was not a successful television network at the time. They were really struggling and as such were willing to try anything because they, they were losing money. So they did this Simpsons show and uh, they asked um, Matt Groening and the producers asked Danny Elfman to write the theme for the show. The producers didn't even know. They came to me and said, would you score the show? Uh, do all the other music and I said sure and at one I mean, I'll never forget one of the producers said to me you know had a meeting with me about how I was going to go about doing it and he said well do you know do you think you can write in the style of Danny Elfman are you familiar and I look I said are you serious <laughs> he goes what do you mean I said yeah yeah motherfucker if anybody can write like Danny I can I was in a band with him for five years sure no problem and and then Danny and I had a conversation or two about it and laughed about it. And, but I didn't interact with Danny. I just had his, he had kind of set a certain sound with that theme. And I just spun off of that and did something different. They wanted me to score the show, by the mm -hmm. way. Uh, they had budgeted it to do it with synthesizers and samplers. And um, I, I refused. I said, no, no, that's not how to do this. And they were they were thinking, well, they figured, well, because I'm a I was a synthesis, you know, that was my I should be able to save them a lot of money by doing it. And I could have, but I didn't want to. I thought that would sound like crap. I was I still don't like shows that are done that way. And I I said, look, um I'm I'm as good as anybody at doing that. I'm I'm a synthesis by trade, I'm a programmer, and I don't want to do that. You've got a two-dimensional show here. It's a flat animated show, and you need to give it that third dimension. You need that other emotion to come off the screen, and that's only going to come from human beings in a studio playing the music to give it that, de that depth and that emotion. And they bought that pitch, and that was... Um, so still to this day, the show is done with live players, but... That first season, I did it with usually about thirty-five players, a thirty-five piece orchestra. Long ramble there. I, I don't. I don't. I don't even remember the first question, but there you go.
<laughs> oh, that's okay. That's it's really fascinating to hear. Like, thank you for rambling on. I do remember you telling a story about, I think, uh, directing uh, the orchestra during these scoring sessions. Or oh something. well, yeah. I mean, it was. Uh, uh, I learned a lot. I had basically I had a, an orchestra every week for 13 weeks at my beck and call. And I was still pretty young and I'm writing for a 35 piece orchestra. Boy, there's, I mean, yeah, I'd studied this in school, but I wasn't actually writing for orchestra every week. I wasn't writing, you know, 25 cues. And, um, I'd learned all sorts of shortcuts and cool things to do and fun ways to work and, you know, honed my, my conducting chops. And they, they kind of, they just gave me carte blanche. They meaning the producers, they just let me rip. They just let me do it. because they didn't know they, they didn't have a particular thing in mind either. My favorite story about that was Matt Groening would always come to the, uh, the recording sessions But he would never say anything, not a word. He would, uh, you know, I might see him afterwards. Like, oh, that's really nice. Thanks, thanks, good work. And one day I saw him on the lot, uh, walking around on the lot. And I said, Matt, you know, um, if if you're having a, an issue with anything, if you want anything different, you can hit the talk back button while I'm conducting and tell me what you want. I mean, if you're concerned about what's going on, if that's why you're coming, and he goes. He just said it was one of the sweetest things I've ever had somebody say to me. He said, oh, no, no, no. I just come because it's a free concert. So, like, okay. It was brilliant. It was so much fun. It's so cute. Yep. Oh, sounds really fun because you you were still young and you were learning as you go because the, the gigs just came to you. You didn't really actively seek out. No, I wasn't. I, I wasn't hungry in that way. You know, I wasn't desperate. There was... And still to this day, I, I, I don't operate from desperation. I, I don't think anybody operates well from desperation. That's not a good place to be. No, I just try to, well, as, a, as I manage a few artists and a few composers, I try to aim them in the right direction, but I'm not going to just give them something because they're desperate. So I also need, no. you know, you need a project that will fit them and they need something they actually want to do and not just sometimes they need to eat as well well yeah so, but we joined a union uh, you and may have heard of it the union of musicians and the light workers oh the the american federation of musicians uh no that's something else but that's another union that's fighting for uh nowadays for younger people in the industry the necessity of unions you know kind of working to get us to livable wages as musicians whether we're doing session work or putting out albums or trying to get gigs. I can speak to that too. Um, the, the Musicians Union, the American Federation of Musicians, is probably the weakest union in Hollywood in terms of their negotiating. Yeah, they don't have much negotiating power here uh, at all. Um, it, it's very weak. Um, it's very easy to work around the union. It's only, only of, of it's only like on film dates and uh, and TV dates are they um, do they come into play much? Usually on record dates, they aren't even they aren't a presence at all. And a lot of film date, independent film and stuff is done. They work around the union. They do non-union work, and specifically. As a composer, they don't represent you. They they will put you on a contract. There's a line in their contract for a composer, but um, it, it's a joke what you know what you get through the union as a composer. It doesn't even begin to reflect the amount of work that a composer puts in. So composers, here's the the wild thing: composers have no union or guild in the United States. At all. Nothing at no. all in the U.S.? They have not since, I uh, don't know no, the exact year, I'm going to say 1972. Um, but even prior to that, it was very weak. There used to be the, um, the Composers and Lyricists Guild of America. 
that was, I think, formed in the 50s and was tr trying to build it up through the 60s and the studios um, went after them and basically destroyed them. Um, the, the head of that mm -hmm. guild for a long time was Elmer Bernstein. I don't know if you know Elmer's work, but you know, one of my favorite all time film composers and it, it pretty much broke Elmer. He, he was trying to keep it afloat with his own money for years. So there've been several attempts since then to organize a union for composers and lyricists. And, um, and each one has uh, run ashore, has hit the rocks. And I was on the steering committee of the last major attempt to do so a few years back. And we were organizing with the Teamsters. <clears throat> we were gonna be Teamsters, which is, I don't know if you know the Teamsters Union, but that's a very powerful union in the United States. Uh, they Basically, those, that's the truck drivers, right? All the drivers are Teamsters. Oh, right. And uh, the Teamsters have the power to shut down any production because if they say, you know, if you don't do what we say, your cameras, are, your set pieces, nothing's going to show up. This is not going to get there. We're going to shut down your production overnight. And they've done it in the past. So nobody messes with the Teamsters, and they wanted to organize us to be part of the Teamsters Union. And it was uh, it was an exciting possibility, um, but it didn't happen for a whole host of reasons that could be a whole nother podcast unto itself. But I know the relatively the nuts and bolts of how unions work vis-a-vis -vis composers and musicians here. And it's not a pretty picture. No, I feel like it's very different when it comes to France compared to the U.S. because you probably know that France has built its workers' rights and um, the fact that, you know, we have free health care and many, many things thanks to unions and uh, fighting a lot all the time over the past century. Well, the so. French have always been much better with the arts, right? Most of Europe, most European, <laughs> most of Europe. I mean, you have... Don't you have like a ministry of culture or some some equivalent to of that? Of course. Yes, we yeah, do. You say, of course. We don't have that in the United States. There's no equivalent. All oh, right. That, yeah, that's true. There's no cabinet level position that deals with the arts at all. It's ridiculous. There was a move afoot when Obama was elected to form a um, you know a cabinet position, have a secretary of the arts. And there was a big petition that was circled around with hundreds of thousands of uh, signatures to uh, appoint Quincy Jones as the Secretary of the Arts, which would have been amazing. But I don't think they ever really took it seriously and it never happened. It still needs to happen. We don't have representation at, at a government level like most civilized countries in the world do. Well, this is what makes it a little bit a little bit scary when you come from a country like France yes. and you're thinking, well, I'm going to get out uh, to California and, you know, meet people from the industry and see where I can go from there. And uh, and then you just get dropped by all the legal protections and state level protections you have. Well, you guys home. invented the PRO, right? SASM was the very first PRO, not us. You, you guys did it, the French. Oh, the SASM, yeah. Yeah, SASM was long before BMI and ASCAP and is still a much more powerful and much better run organization than what we have going on over here. The representation for the arts at the, at the legal level, governmental and otherwise, is really weak. It's very bad. Well, the, the French administrative services are always very... Very tedious, very slow, and it you know it really gets on my nerves when it comes to signing up an artist for SSM. But you know that in the end you will run into a lot of right. problems because I remember some some talks we had at the CBC when it came to black boxes yep. and and lots of money that just didn't go to the artist. It just went completely lost yep. for some reason. Yeah, it's usually just simple incompetence. It's not usually, you know, it's not people trying to rip anybody off. It's just, you know, just people, people are stupid, <laughs> you know.
in a nutshell, people, <laughs> you know, title the, the, you know, somebody who's entering it, uh, you know, into the computer and they misspell the name of the queue or the name of the composer and it, it gets lost. It happens all the time. I've, I've found, I've had a lot of money found for me over the years by forensic accountants going back in and figuring this, this stuff out. I Sasem is so careful about uh, how you input your music into their system that once it's there, it's rock solid. Yes. It's not true here. Well, it's, it, it is much more difficult to make sure everything is in place, but once it's in place, it, it does work, it does tend to work pretty well for everybody. But uh, it's something I am scared about as somebody who's trying to export a little bit of my work to California as I'm going to be there for three months uh, in mid-August, given everything goes fine. But um, we will see. We'll see about that. Cool. Uh, I did have some questions from other okay. people uh, who mainly know you from okay. Boingo. I'll take a Boingo question. What do you got? Uh, they got a couple. So you've mentioned uh, earlier, yes, you were talking about The Simpsons. You mentioned that you had a talk with Tani again. So I assume that you guys had no, you didn't leave on No, terms. not at all. I left the band in 1984 when my, when our first son was born, like that month, that's when I, I tendered my resignation because I, you know, my focus wasn't in the band anymore. I wanted to, I wanted to stay home. I didn't want to tour. I didn't want to do endless rehearsals. And I always made more money, always outside of the band than I did within the band. I was a session player and was making pretty good money. I was making more money than Danny then. And now he makes a lot more money than I do. But um, but uh, I didn't need the band financially. I did it because I... I liked it and it was fun and it was a, it was a great calling card for me too. But after having done that for three albums and I don't know how many years, five years, four or five years, I was in the band. Um, it was time to move on. And I wanted to be able to spend more time. I didn't want to go out on the road. I wanted to spend time with my infant son and I didn't want to miss, you know, his first steps or his first words or any of that. So so, so I left. That was, that was why I left. I mean, we, we had a little bit of a legal kerfuffle a few years later, um, but there were never, it was never about harsh words or anything. It was just um, some money that, that the band owed me. That, and I'm, when I say some money, I'm just talking about a few thousand dollars. It was nothing. And Danny and I worked it out between us and all was good. So, I, you know, I'm still very much friendly with Danny. He's one of the few speakers I've had that, you know, few composer speakers I've had to the breakfast club because I knew everybody wanted to hear what Danny had to say. Honestly, remember what I said, why I said I picked people to speak is because I want to hear what they have to say. I already know Danny. I was in the band with the guy for five years, even though it was a long time ago. I know, you know, I have a pretty good idea and pretty good memory of how he thinks and I'm friendly with him, I'm not going to learn much from Danny that I don't already know from him. So it didn't excite me, but it finally, oh yeah, everybody else is going to want to hear what Danny has to say. I should get him to speak. And I managed to, I had to, I actually, he kind of drove me nuts. He didn't want to speak at nine o'clock in the morning. It was too early for him because he's such a night owl. So it was the only time we've held the breakfast. I think it was at noon or one o'clock. It's the only time we've ever did did that. I did it for Danny. Um, God, uh, but that's um, yeah. I'm still I'm still very much on friendly terms with Danny, and we we exchange emails. Some topic comes up or another that's of interest to one or the other, and we flip emails back and forth. I wished him a happy birthday, you know, all that kind of stuff. We were never like close buddies when I was in the band. We didn't hang out much or anything the band i was i was the keyboard player in boingo that was kind of it, it there the the band was formed by there were long-term friendships within that band that predated me by many years so i was the when i joined i was the you know i was the pup i was the newbie and i was the newbie until the day i left so that that was that was my relationship within that band 
And I'm still friends with all the guys. I talked to Johnny Vatos once in a while and Steve Bartek. Um, you know, there's another, there are other branches of the Composers Breakfast Club. And there's one in Venice uh, that was meeting uh, in person in Venice. And because and, that was close to Steve's house, he used to go to that one. Oh, nice. But creatively at the time, yeah, I heard that people besides Danny didn't really have much control. So maybe you found a better creative outlet elsewhere as well. Well, for me, afterwards. yeah. I mean, that, that's a big reason why I left was that I, um, I already had, I had already started my own band outside of Boingo so I could write for it. Right. I wanted, I'm, you know, I wanted to write songs and I, I, my, my writing style was different than Danny's and I had different, I was just kind of stretching my creative wings and um, I couldn't do that within Boingo. Boingo was Danny's vehicle. And so I started another band. It was my vehicle, which ultimately we only managed to get one album out and, and then, then the band fell apart, but I was glad I did it. Anyway, it was fun. That was Zuma, Zuma 2, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, good luck finding that record. No, we can't find the record no, anywhere. No. It's just one very low quality. No, the, yeah, the, yeah the, somebody put that up. That's a somebody had a a VHS copy of it, and that with and you can see that the VHS tape is screwed up, and you can hear it warble and everything. It's still blurry. I don't. I don't have a good version of it. The uh, master, the master tape, I'm sure exists somewhere in CBS Records vaults. And someday when I have time and I feel inclined, I'm going to go find somebody that will help me dig that out of the vault so I can get a clean copy of that video, at least. That's the least I can do. I would be excited. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to get I will do that at some point. That'll, that'll, be a, that'll be a fun project in and of itself, just doing that. That'll be a podcast itself. Oh, yeah. Well, we're looking forward to hearing so many other stories for, from you in that podcast because you're... Yeah, you say a lot that you know. Oh, that's a story for another time, and uh, there's going to be many other times. I think. The, you know, I I sat down when when that uh, the guy that ran the podcast that runs Pantheon Podcast um, asked me to have other stories. I said, "Yeah, tons." And he goes, "Well, how many?" And I go, "Well, give me a second. And I sat down. I'm going to pull up. The, I'm going to pull this up right now while I'm talking to you. I decided to just write a um, a list of topics, right? Just I knew that I had a story in each one of these topics. And I'm looking at it right now. Let's see, it's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. I'm going to say about 70, 80 oh topics. And I've done 13 so far. So there you go. I got tons of stories. And, and um, I'm starting now to kind of get a little more personal with them. All the story, the first bunch were mostly about, I mean, they're personal in that they're about my career, but I'm now I'm also kind of going back into stuff that doesn't necessarily have anything directly to do with music. Also very interesting, the latest episode, just very good memories to hear about. It's just, um, you know, you, you put a lot of ambience into it again, and it was very fun to listen to and unwind. After a, a yeah, I've day. got, and I've got, and I'll, also they've all been pretty, except for the one about the studio almost burning down, they've all been pretty lighthearted and kind of fun, right? This, uh, uh, you know, they're all, they, mm -hmm. they all have a smile in them somewhere. And uh, the, the Woodshed uh, Chronicles, it, there's not much to laugh about in that because, you know, our house burned down and everything that went on with that. But I felt it was an important story to tell. And there'll be some more like that coming up. I, you know, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm trying to pull everybody in with the fun stories, and then I'll start getting to the deeper stuff uh, as as the podcast progresses. Yeah, it's not it's not all sunshine and right. rainbows. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, not at all. Well, I'm glad that you've been able to tell all these stories thus far, and that you're going to have so much more in the future. And um, sure, did you have any? Were, were there other Boingo questions you said? Somebody. <laughs> Somebody wanted to know the meaning to whole day off, and I told them that you probably don't know because you did not That's write the song. A, yes, you're absolutely correct. B, here's a funny thing. 
I didn't know the lyrics to the songs because I wasn't a singer per se. Every once in a blue moon, I would sing like on some of the records, like on Grey Matter and some of the songs, the low vocal is me because I had a deeper voice than anybody in the band. My singing voice was low. But um, for the most part, I wasn't singing. I would just do low parts or shout parts. And so I didn't learn the lyrics. And I used to learn the lyrics that when I first started playing with the band and we're playing at the whiskey and other places, I would watch the girls in the front row singing along and read their lips and go, Oh, that's what Danny's singing. <laughs> that's how I learned the words. A lot of times <laughs> I didn't really pay attention to the lyric. I, I still don't. It's not really my first love. You know, when I'm, when I listen to music, I respond to the music. I listen to songs. It's the music that gets me. It's not the lyric. It's the lyric is totally secondary to me. And if the lyric is good, then, it, then it's, uh, you know, then it's gravy. It's, it's icing on the cake as it were. But um, I never start with the lyric first. I can't think of a single song that I listen to because I like the lyric, but I don't care about the music. Never. That's not how it works. So I didn't really pay much attention to the, I, I couldn't tell you what Danny's thinking when he wrote any of his songs, what they were about. I never asked. I didn't care. Just not my, that's not how my brain is wired. Sorry. <laughs> tell your friend, sorry. That's okay. I would have asked you if you have, I mean, you probably have a lot of bongo stories, no, you but we're going to run over time. And I, I'm sure that you're going to tell us a lot of those well, I drop the them in here and here, here and there on the podcast when it seems appropriate. Um, but I don't want, you know, the podcast is not about Boingo. So I, you know, I parse them out. I find that the more interesting yes. stories are not about Boingo. But, you know, when it comes up as I'm writing something, um, when it comes up that, to bring in Boingo in the story, I bring them in, you know. Plenty of the podcasts don't, you know, Bungles are not even, not even a shadow in it. I mean, it really was. It really was. It was five years, four and a half, five years of my my career, and I'm 65 now. So you can, it's it's a very small portion of my overall career. Oh okay, yeah. Well, in retrospect, it's kind of tiny compared to everything. Yeah, else I've been a film composer done. far longer than I was a member of Oingo Boingo. I've been a session player far longer. I've been a studio owner longer. Then I was a member of Boingo. I, not, I'm not denigrating my time in Boingo. I, I liked it. It was fun. And I was glad I did it. But it's not, it doesn't define who I am. You know, I, it, sometimes I will, I, you know, in certain contexts, I'll be talking to somebody and I'll realize they're Boingo, you know, they like you to be a Boingo fan. And I say, yeah, I was the keyboard player in Boingo. And that can open doors to a conversation, but, but it's not what I think about, you know, by and large. Well, of course, well, I imagine you'd like to be recognized for, you know, more than just being the keyboard player in Boingo. Um, yeah. I don't even think about what I'd like to be recognized for. I, I think I'd like to be a podcaster. There you go. That's my new career. <laughs> You know, you know who I, do you know who Spalding Gray was? You ever heard that name? I've heard it, but I'm not sure I know. Spalding Gray was a monologist. And it was basically like kind of live podcaster in a way. He is my inspiration for the style of these podcasts. He would go just tell stories in, you know, on, on a stage and then behind him, he would be projecting uh, little clips or photos on a screen that would illustrate the points of the story that he's telling from his own life or about somebody else's life. And I loved his format and how he did that. That's probably the biggest single inspiration for me as a podcaster. And I could see myself, it would be fun for me to be a to do what he did to perform live and tell these stories live and bring them, bring another dimension to them with, you know, on camera, I mean, on, on stage, um, you know, visual cues as well. It could, it could take it to another place. Mm -hmm. If you go to the podcast, to the, 
uh, the website for the podcast, invisiblearts.com, every episode has a series of photos and some of the captions are little stories in and of themselves. Yeah, th- those are kind of adjuncts. I think that was a great idea. Yeah, that's just to further illustrate the stories that I tell in the podcast. Just little fun little things. I could easily blow up that into a live show. You know what I mean? That would be an amazing idea. It'd be fun. It's something it'd be fun to do. And, you know, podcasts don't make money, as we already covered. But live performance can. There are a lot of, Mm. um, you know, public speaking can be quite lucrative. I have friends who do this that don't have even the career I've had that are getting twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars a night to go tell their stories. Jeez. So that's maybe oh, maybe I'll do that. That'd be fun. Something to do my, the last <laughs> act in my old age. But I've got other things I want to do too. So I'm really aiming right now. Um, I don't. I can't make the official announcement yet, but we're. Um, I'm on the verge of starting a production company for doing uh, films. And I've got a particular project right mm. now that we're, we're looking to um, get up on its feet um, pretty soon. That's going to be pretty cool. It's going to be quite different. It's a documentary, but not like a, a typical documentary. It's going to just like my podcasts are trying not to be a typical podcast. This documentary won't be a typical documentary. So to, to be determined. That's really exciting. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you know. Thank you for sharing the news. Uh, do I do I get to keep that in the podcast? Oh, sure. I mean, you know, there's nothing official that I've announced there yet. So, sure. One last question while we're on air. Yeah. Uh, what was with the uh, two-colored haircut that you had in the 80s? <laughs> um, that's pretty funny you would ask that. That's actually a whole, it's, it's one of the episodes I... I I've been playing one of the topics I put was just simply hair, right? You know, all of the stuff, all of my own personal hairstyles over the years, you know, I, I, I started out when I was a little kid with a Beatles haircut kind of, and, and then, uh, then I, then by the time I was in high school, I was a full on hippie with long curly hair and, you know, surfer hippie boy. And then went to Berkeley, I cut my hair at one point when I was at Berkeley and then came out here, let it grow again. And then had a little, had a mustache, a little goatee going for a while. And then I, uh, you know, got the gig to, you know, to join Boingo, which I tell in how that happened in the episode called Never Be Home. And when I went and auditioned for the band and they liked what I did and um, it's like, okay, I got, I got the gig and Danny pulled me aside and said, okay, there's a few things we need to talk about. I said, sure. And we went back. And so it's like, they used to rehearse in Dan, Danny had a loft down on Washington Boulevard, like an industrial part of LA. It was a very, very funky area. And he had this weird loft room and in the back, in this kind of small room in the back, the band was jammed in there. And that's where we rehearsed. And Danny pulls me into his loft space where his where his loft bedroom was to talk to me privately. He goes, okay, there's a couple things. And he kind of talked to me about the, how the band works, the politics of the band. And then one other thing, he goes, hey, you're going to have to cut your hair. Because, you know, we're there's a certain image that we're trying to portray. It's all about you know, the, the new wave punk era and this long curly hair goatee thing wasn't going to work. And, and I just kind of said, yeah, oh, okay, all right, sure. And I, I cut my hair. It was the first time I'd had my hair really short since I was a little boy, really. And it kind of, it kind of threw me for a minute. And, oh, God, there's so many stories about hair I could give. And then um, at one point, one of our uh, sometime roadies was also a, a hairdresser he was he would do like punk and new wave haircuts for people and he said hey i got some ideas for you you want to have some fun i go i don't care yeah sure so he's the one who designed that whole thing where he bleached by the side of my head and it came to a v in the back of my head the bottom of my head and so the sides were like white blonde and uh, the top was, you know, my natural brown. The rest of it was brown. 
and then he would put a little bit of bleach. It always made me nervous when he did it in my eyebrow. And one eyebrow would have a little stripe of blonde in it, like white blonde. And I thought it was funny and fun and why not? Didn't take much more of it. And then I left the band and I still had that hairstyle going on when I left. And I went to see the band play after I left. And there was a guy in the theater seeing the band that had copped my haircut. Just the guy who was sitting there in the theater and he had the exact same haircut that I had had. And I said, like, that's it. I've got to cut. I can't do this. And I cut it and started all over. <laughs> and since then, I've had, I had, uh, I let my hair grow out again. Then I had dreadlocks almost down, you know, halfway down my back. And then coincidentally started working with corn. Nice. And uh, my dreads were better than Jonathan's. You can tell him I said that. And um, Monkey had better dreads than I did, the, the guitar player. Um, and I had those for a long time. And finally, anyway, long story. But as far as the two color hair, that's how that happened. Oh, that is a great story. Thank you. Sure. Oh, God. Well, thank you so much for uh, for being here, for um, for accepting accepting this this invitation because this was a long time coming and um i do wish you happy trails on your future endeavors thank you great musicians tea time is a production of acid airplane records and is hosted by gabrielle chanet and sid levine all episodes come with a full transcript and translation into french on the acid airplane records website thanks so much for tuning in today <laughs>